Okay, we'll start in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 tonight, and we're going to read through verse 3. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a, a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, this is just one of the many verses, many passages that warn about deception in the last days. And um, we can see that all around us. Uh, there's many passages that talk like this, and I'm going to go through a number of different ones. But tonight, the, the sermon is going to be on deception and discernment. Knowing those two, understanding a little bit more, maybe uh, the sermon will help you leave with a better understanding of how to discern what's right what's good out there. Uh, Because there's a lot of confusion, a lot of craziness, a lot of things that are are backwards and wrong, but they look right sometimes. And um, we're told to judge righteously and believe not every spirit. In John chapter 7, verse 24, nice short verse, it says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Not according to the appearance, but righteous judgment. 1 John 4 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There's many passages like this warning us, and there's tremendous danger in this world right now, tremendous confusion. And we know God is not the author of confusion. We know that. We have a passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches of the saints. He's not the author of confusion. Before we go further, we're going to start breaking this down. Let's pray before we start. Father God, Lord, please guide me as I speak tonight. Lord, help me only say your words, what you'd have me say to encourage the people here and help the people here. Father, this message is a warning. It's uh, trying to, to make the people and myself... Remember to beware of the, the dangers in this world, the false prophets, the, the wrong spirits, all the different things that will twist and try to distract and, and disable us. Father, guide me and help me. May this be for your glory. Lord, uh, I, I'm just a servant, small and weak, and I need your help, Lord. Thank you, Father. Guide me again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we see confusion in this world right now. And we know God's not the author of confusion, but we can see confusion in Christian circles. And here's, I just listed a couple here, but this was a big one that just happened. Whether or not to follow the government mandates on COVID-19, vaccine, vaccine, vaccination, and masking. That caused a lot of confusion in churches. There was people that were for it, people against it. There was all kinds of different discussions, arguments. It was kind of chaos for a time. It's, it's, it's the days we're in, the latter days we're in. Another area of confusion, basic news. And before I go further, I have to say, I'm going to be a little pointed tonight, and it's not trying to get after anybody or go after anybody or call out anything. I'm not even trying to give my opinion. I want to provide what the Bible says about discernment, how we can make a decision, judge between right and wrong based on God's word, not based on how we feel, not based on just our general opinion, but what does God's word say and how do we go about that? So basic news, this was an area of confusion and it still is an area of confusion. Different channels on the TV give different news. That's not how it used to be But every channel now, almost every channel, is biased. They have some bias that they push, and they push and they push. So one person may watch this channel, one person may watch this channel, and they're getting two different feeds on everything. Now, there is a right and a wrong. (laughs) Not saying they're all right. But you get this confusion because you talk to somebody else, and they haven't seen what you've seen for news. They've had a different take on it. And I know I've seen that confusion in our church. Individuals that have seen different news that is a different perspective, different bias. So there's confusion in just the news on TV. 
Confusion in, and this one's blunt, blatant, politics. Absolutely confusion everywhere in politics. Confusion in church about that as well. And this one is of the times, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, but revivals that are happening. And Matt talked a little bit about um, this revival that um, people are talking about. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit in just a little bit here. But revivals, there's confusion in just that. And I'll call it out. There's something called the Asbury Revival right now. Um, It ended in that location, but it's still going on in multiple other locations. And there's confusion between Christians on whether or not this is a good or bad or what it is or how it's going. There's a lot of confusion in that area. And I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to try to give you what the Bible says about discernment. How can you discern whether or not it's from God? Um. There are wrong doctrines being accepted more and more. And we see that in churches. People, they're looking around. They're looking at the world and how things are going. And they're thinking, some people are going, we must be in the tribulation. This is really bad. There's people that are they're saying the pre-trib rapture didn't happen. It's not going to happen. And now they're switching to a post-trib, Jesus returning at the end of the tribulation period. And Christians going through that. That's something that people are switching to now. We're not in the tribulation. The tribulation is much, much worse than what we're going through right now. So that's an interesting study. Replacement theology. This is a huge one right now. A lot of people are accepting replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. It's that the belief that church is the new Israel. Israel's been forsaken by God. We know that's not true because God keeps his promises. And he made a covenant with Israel, and he will keep it. And we know the book of Revelation is all about Israel. I mean, it's just one thing after another, Israel. So replacement theology is not correct. This is something, one of those wrong doctrines that people are accepting. Um, You see these weird focuses on specific things, too. This is another one that I've noticed. Christians that are unbalanced. We're supposed to walk a balanced life a balanced Christian life where we, we don't go too far any one direction in doctrine. We walk according to God's word is what I'm trying to say. We don't pick one and then focus on that and focus on it and then start churning away from other doctrines because that's our focus. You can see that many times in Bible prophecy. A Christian will get so focused on Bible prophecy that they'll start neglecting other doctrines, other teachings of God to occupy, to share the gospel, to do, to help each other in church. They'll start focusing in one area, and you see that more and more right now, an unbalanced focus in different areas, latching onto one doctrine and pushing it too far. And I believe that's Calvinism and Arminianism. But picking, this was one, pick, there's, do I go here? Uh, picking, there's a, a group of evangelicals that believe in picking a name for Jesus and sticking to one name. And this is something that bothers me, but it's one of those things that it's a focus where the Bible says there's many names and many passages that say these are the names of Jesus. There's, there's areas like that, and we see Christians now that are focusing in one area, and that's what they focus in. We see the hyper-grace movement. Hyper-grace is something that's growing. And I, I took a, a, a section just to describe this the way it is. They say it so much better than I could ever describe it. But this is hyper-grace and what's going on. A lot of Christians are accepting this. Hyper-grace describes a new wave of teaching that emphasizes the grace of God to be to the exclusion of other vital teachings, such as repentance and confession of sin. Hyper-grace teach, teachers maintain that all sin past, present, and future, has already been forgiven, and there is no need for a believer to ever confess it. Hypergrace teaching says that when God looks at us, he sees only a holy, righteous people. The conclusion of hypergrace teaching is that we are not bound by Jesus' teaching, even as we are not under the law, that believers are not responsible for their sin, and that anyone who disagrees is a pharisaical legalist. Did you get that? There was a lot there in that. 
But it's basically, you don't have to, 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. They discount that. And they actually teach that Bible verse is for the lost. Even though right after it says, these things have been written under you in, uh, in verse 2. We could turn over there. But in chapter 2 of that, it says that it was written to them. So, but here's another one that discounts that. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. It says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. This is Jesus talking to the churches. And he says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, the hyper grace, they say there's no reason to repent. Because they're basically, there is no sin. They have no sin anymore. Well, this is saying, God is saying, repent or remove your candlestick. And he says that to five of the seven churches. Repent or I'll remove your candlestick. It's really interesting. They can't discount that. Why would God have you repent if you never do anything wrong anymore? There's many other arguments against it, but this is one area where people are, are focusing in the hyper-grace movement. Hyper-grace leads to hyper-dispensationalism, which is another one. And I know we're getting into big theological terms. I'm going to get out of this in just a second here. But hyper-dispensationalism is something that, and I'm going to give you a quote here, that can cause massive damage in a church. Um, it often goes with hyper-grace, And these people, and I wrote this down too, they discount the other dispensations as not applying to the church. Now, the Bible teaches and really shows various dispensations through time. We're in the dispensation or the age of grace. This is the church age. There were other ones. The Old Testament had different dispensations. These people say the Old Testament is not for us. It doesn't apply to the New Testament church. Basically they negate the worth of the Old Testament. And they do it in a, a, a few different ways. But they'll, they will say various verses, and the Old Testament may not apply to us because we are the church of God in the New Testament. Different dispensation. The hyper dispensation says the four Gospels are for the Jews only. Or they say some of the Gospels are for the Jews only. That's major. To say, these are for the Jews, this isn't for us, Christians. This was a quote from uh, Harry Ironside. And he, during his time, there was a big fight over this whole dispensationalism. And he had this quote. And it's, it's harsh. But he said this, A strong dispensationalist himself, this is Harry Ironside, wrote a good booklet outlining some of the dangers of ultra dispensationalism or hyper dispensationalism. In it, he says that he has no hesitancy in saying that ultra dispensationalism's fruits are evil. It has produced a tremendous crop of heresies throughout the length and breadth of this and other lands. It has divided Christians and wrecked churches and assemblies without number. It has lifted up its votaries in intellectual and spiritual pride to an appalling extent, so that they look with supreme contempt upon Christians who do not accept their particular views." In most instances where it has been long tolerated, it has absolutely throttled gospel effort at home and sown discord on missionary fields abroad. So true are these things of this system that I have no hesitancy in saying it is an absolutely satanic perversion of the truth. That is a hard statement. Basically, this this doctrine that is just a little bit off of what we believe, he's saying it's absolutely satanic and a perversion of the truth truth, and has divided churches, wrecked churches. And I can see that. I can see how. It's one of those things where people, you have the two sides and they just keep arguing, going back and forth. They're so close that it causes a split. And it's just one of those those things. But these doctrines, these these errors, people are accepting more and more. They're believing these things. People are going these directions. And I know we've had discussions in this church, and I'm not going to call out anything, but we've had discussions in this church over these very things, going back and forth with some of the men. And it has caused a certain amount of dissension at times. 
So this is something we can see. And I'm seeing danger more and more. And I know there's other men here that are too. We talk back and forth. And we can see this world is crazy. This nation is falling. There's so much going on. And I've preached on it. Others have preached on it. But there's so much danger. And at this time, we've got to have discernment like never before. I mean, more so. We always should have had discernment. But we should really have it and be exercising it today. So I'm going to go through the steps to discerning and talk a little bit more about deception. But we see in 2 Timothy 3.1, it says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. We're in those days. I think we have to agree that we're in those days. So deception, where does it come from? What deception can we see? Men who preach another gospel. I'm going to list just a couple here and move on to discernment and how to discern. But we should be warned of deception, where it comes from, what we can see that's deceptive. Uh, The first point I would have is men who preach another gospel. They either preach another Jesus, they preach another purpose in life, another reason for being for mankind, another anything for the purpose of man. Another anything that is hope, is life, is a goal in life. Our purpose is to share the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus came, he died for us, the sins of mankind, was buried, rose again the third day. He is our hope of salvation. He paid the price for our sins. That is the gospel. That is the only gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other good news. None. Galatians 1, 7a says, Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Though we, or any angel from heaven, preach unto you another gospel... We're supposed to reject it. Any man that preaches another gospel, we reject. Deception. And there are so many men out there that preach gospels. They'll preach a Jesus that you go, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And then, wait, I don't agree with that. That is not the same Jesus that we know in God's word. Not the same Jesus. We must not be naive in thinking that all men who call themselves Christians are actually Christians. Often, I think Christians are very naive and just somebody says they're a Christian and then we think immediately, oh, it's a brother or a sister and then start fellowshipping with them or something. We can't be naive and immediately accepting what they say. Because not all people that say they're Christians are Christians. And I would actually say the vast majority in our nation that say they're Christians are not Christians in any sort of way. They're traditional Christians that were raised in a Christian home, maybe, or their parents called themselves Christians but only went to church once a year. But they are not Bible-believing, blood-bought Christians, Bible-believing Christians. They're not the real thing. If they're not real Christians, they don't have your best interests at heart. Remember, a real real Christian will have the Holy Spirit indwelling them, and they will care about you. They will have a love for you that is a godly love. The people of this world, though, that are not Christians, do not have the Holy Spirit. They have one person on that throne, and that's themselves. You cannot trust them. Romans 8, verse 9b, it says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's not partially a Christian. He either is or he isn't. And this is a, an interesting thought with that. With this men will deceive you. The gate is narrow, so few will find it. We know the gate is narrow. And the context of the passage is fascinating too. As I was looking this up, it says in Matthew chapter 7, and you can turn over there real quick, Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And the context, which is really neat, right after that, it talks about false prophets. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? 
Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. It ties together perfectly. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way. And then it talks about false prophets. We have to be immediately skeptical. And it's a sad thing. But when a person says they're a Christian, do a little probing. Do a little bit of, so what do you believe? Maybe where do you go to church? Are you active in any sort of, those sort of questions. Probing rather than just accepting it and becoming best friends. Because this ties, there will be very few. There will be very few with false prophets. There's false prophets out there. So there's also another area of deception is churches that preach another gospel. And I went through those other gospels. But people will want to gather together, and they're doing it today. They'll want to gather together to have their ears itched. And I love the way the Bible says that. These people, oh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. There's many churches out there now. The the pastors or preachers or whatever they are, entertainers really is what it is now. They only talk about or do what the people want them to do. There's a lot of churches like that out there. And there's a lot of churches that are halfway in between. They might preach something good, but it's all entertainment the rest of the time. It's like they're itching the ears and not itching the ear. It's, it's something in the middle that's really confusing. There's a lot of that now. Stuff that is just all over the place. Not, not really pure, but not openly wicked. And I think it's a, a lukewarm wickedness is what it is. But also, another one. Wolves and beasts. The Bible talks about wolves and beasts. And I just want to read these verses real quick because I... I think they're interesting. In Jude, verse 4, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jude, verses 10 and 14, 10 through 14, it says, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Wow. Those verses are very hard. But there are wolves, there are beasts out there. They want to devour the people in this church. They want to hurt the people in this church. So I gave three right there, just three areas of deception we'll see it from. It's all over the place. We can see it on the news. We can see it everywhere we look in this world. There is deception. But there are specific men that are trying to target the people of God, trying to target Christians to pull them away. There are churches that are trying to target Christians. And I believe there's wolves and beasts, as the Bible describes, men that are, that the Bible calls beasts and wolves that are out there trying to waylay Christians. Well, how do we discern? So this is the the next point I have. How do you discern what's right and wrong? I mean, is there a way to do it without just kind of, flying by the seat of your pants, going here, going there, and just floating along. There is, I think there's a godly, scriptural way of discerning right and wrong. What's, what's from the Spirit of God? To discern, what does the word mean, discern? I always got to define it for myself because if somebody asked me what discern means, I'd say some words and I'd probably be off. But it means to distinguish the difference between two things. 
distinguish the difference between two different things. To judge the difference, to determine between good and evil, truth and falsehood. So pretty simple. You're making a choice between right and wrong. We're commanded, we are commanded, this is a command, to believe not every spirit. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, and we read that, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. It says, believe not every spirit. That means that we stop. There's a, a point when we hear something from someone, we stop and we go, what is this? We don't just immediately believe them. We stop and we go, is this truth? Is this right? We don't immediately accept things. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We don't walk along completely blind. We walk along with God's word and by faith. We walk along by the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to try, and that says up there, but try the spirits. What does try mean? Well, try means to test or examine. We test or examine. The test is in the the passage that actually follows 1 John 4, 1. Um, And actually, you can turn over there real quick. I'll turn over there too. First John chapter 4, verse 1. We'll read beyond that to, I think, verse 7. It says, Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. This is a tremendous passage in testing the spirits out there. This is a list, and this could be a whole bunch of sermons, another sermon. I'm not actually going to go into this all that that far, but this right here describes how you can discern the spirits. And there's some major questions you can ask immediately. So I just wanted to point that out. That passage is a good one to take home and study, look at, even memorize. Some spirits, we know from that first passage there, 1 John 4, uh, verse 1, some spirits are wrong. Some spirits are wrong. There are many false spirits out there. And we know this truth as well, is that Satan himself will, will appear as an angel of light. So, Spurgeon actually gave this quote about this. I think it's interesting. I think it's well said. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Which is really well said. Because that's how Satan works. He just doesn't appear black and evil and wicked. He makes it as close to the truth as possible to waylay people. So I'm going to repeat that. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right, which is so true. Satan is good at almost truths, almost truths. So don't immediately accept everything you see. Everything you see in Christian news and Christian circles and people are talking about, stop. Because this this verse tells us, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. So I think it's smart to before you just accept it, to go, is this right? So the next step in discerning, I think, would be to go to God's word. So first, you've got to stop yourself from just agreeing with it. And then you've got to go to God's word. Because God's word is our truth. It is our foundation and our truth. This is what we live by, what we go by, what we test everything by. 
This is what we put our faith in. So we have to go to God's word. Remember the Bereans. The Bereans searched the scriptures to, to confirm the truth, what was being preached to them. Acts 17, verse 11 says, These are more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. So they were ready for it. And they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So they checked and they looked and they made sure what they were hearing was correct according to God's word. That is what we must live by, how we must live. We can't trust our feelings. We can't trust our feelings. Many churches would say, trust your feelings. You'll know it's right. It'll come to you. You'll feel it. You can't trust your feelings. That's wrong. The this feels good or this feels right or the experience that is more important than God's word, we can't trust that. We have to go by God's word. We should put no confidence in our own feelings. No confidence at all. And I hear it all the time. You hear it in Christian news and Christian articles. These people talking about how they felt in this situation. How they felt this way. How they f- what does God's word say? Do, is that contrary to God's word? Or does that line up with God's word? If it lines up with it, great. <laughs> if it's contrary, you're wrong. Your feelings are wrong. You're, you're enjoying the wrong thing. The Bible says, and I like this verse. Uh, as Philippians 3, I like all the verses. Philippians 3, 2 and 3 says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. There you go. We that worship God in spirit, we rejoice in Jesus Christ. And we have no confidence in the flesh. Praise the Lord. That's a three-point sermon right there. I just noticed. I love the no confidence in the flesh, though. That is so true. The flesh is so wretched. We have confidence in God's word, faith in God's word, over our feelings. The heart is desperately wicked. These are truths that we all know. But the heart is desperately wicked. So we put our faith in God's word, not in our feelings. So after after we stop ourselves from just agreeing with whatever, so believe not every spirit, we go to God's word. And when I was studying this, I found something, tremendous verse. I know some of the guys are going to really like this verse. But it was in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. And... I was, I was studying this, and there was a saying many years ago in Christians. Christians would say this one saying when they talked about discernment. And I had never heard this. I didn't know it. But it was to the law and to the testimony. That was what they would say. And I looked this up. It's like, where did they get the saying? What does it even mean? To the law and to the testimony. When somebody was asked about discernment, about if something's correct... To the law and to the testimony. It's in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. It's a verse. And the generations of Christians before us would go to this verse to talk about discernment. It says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That is the verse. To the law and to the testimony. What it's saying, and there's a huge debate in commentators and people uh, thinking about this verse... But to the law and to the testimony means God's word. When you're discerning something, you go to God's word. And the second phrase of that verse describes the first to the law and the testimony. To the law and to the testimony. Where do you go for discernment? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, which is the word of God, it is because there is no light in them. And there's many other verses that go along with this. But I've never heard that. It's just neat to think that even Wesley and some of the others, when they thought about discernment, they go to the law and to the testimony. To the law and to the testimony. To God's word we go. That's where we're going for discernment. 
And I think it'd be a neat one, actually, for us to bring back. I mean, God's word's always there. But when we're talking about discernment, to the law and to the testimony, let's go to God's word. And the testimony, just defining a little bit of that, and I wrote some of the, with the commentators, I'm not getting, getting all of that, but the law, God's law. We see that in the first five books of the Bible, but many times it refers to God's entire word, God's law. The testimony is the testimony of God to man, God's witness to man. And one person said it like this, testimony is the witness between God and man of God's will and of man's duty to God. So there's some depth to that. But it means, if you look at the second phrase, God's word. We go to God's word. So we believe not every spirit. We stop ourselves. We go to God's word, to the law and to the testimony. And then we should look at their fruit as well. So if the word of God doesn't line up with what they're saying, what they're doing, we reject them completely. It's not a half-truth. There aren't half-truths. There aren't grays. They are either for the Lord or against the Lord. We should also look at the fruit. And this is the third one, third area, I'd say, in discernment. And Jude, verse 12, it says, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Matthew 7.13 says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles? Verse 20, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. We can see the fruits of what they produce. What is coming from them? That's the question. What's coming from what they're doing, what they're saying? Is it confusion? Is it error? Is it destruction? Is it chaos? What's coming from them? So those would be the the three steps that I throw out there. Three things that are based on God's word for discernment. I'm sure there's more. I'm sure there's better discussions on it. But those are three solid ones that I would try to leave with you tonight. Is stop yourself before just agreeing with anything that's out there. The spirits that are out there. The people that are out there. The churches that are out there. And assess it according to God's word. To the law and to the testimony. Go to God's word and compare it. And then... If you don't know, watch their fruit. See what the fruit is of that group or that person or that church or whatever is going on. And I'm going to give some examples, and I'm, I'm going to leave it to pastor to correct anything <laughs> that, that I get in trouble with. But I'm going to use some examples on doing this. And I'm not giving an opinion. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to say anybody's wrong on anything. I'm trying to leave my opinion out of this completely, but I want to try to dis- just give a few examples in discernment. Um, there's a, a danger in saying I'm discerning something and then just giving opinion. Discernment is different than just opinion. Discernment is according to God's word. So here's the first one. Trump. Yes, I went there. Trump is a, an interesting one. Some Christians following him actually almost worship him. So I'm going to just call some things out with Trump. First thing you do is believe not every spirit. So you stop yourself when you see Trump. Look around at what he's done. Look around at what Christians are doing around him, what other people are doing around him. Some are following Trump like he's Messiah. That is something we're seeing even in Christian circles. And again, I'm not saying I'm against him or anything. I'm not giving an opinion. I'm just trying to point out some things and give some ways to discern. Believe not every spirit. You stop yourself and you look at him. And then you compare him to God's word, to the law and to the testimony. If we look at some of the things, and there's a, there's a divide there. There are things that I can say, this is good. There are things that I can say, this is bad. Here's just a couple things that Abraham accords. This is a hard scriptural evidence of something that is not quite right. In Joel verse 3, or pardon me, chapter 3 verse 2, it says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down in the valley of Jehoshaphat. 
and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. There are a number of verses that talk about not parting the land of Israel. And the Abraham Accords are about giving land to Palestinians, giving the Jewish land to some of the land to the Palestinians. That is directly against God's word. So we see that right there. Here's another one. The pride of Trump. This is a personal thing with Trump. And pride goeth before a fall. We know that. The scripture talks about what God believes about what he thinks about pride and humility. God hates pride. He hates pride. Be careful By that, those couple things, and I'm not going into all the different things, positive and negative, because there's a list on either side. Be careful. This is what I say. Be careful in following Trump. Be careful. It's a warning. Look at the fruit. That's the third point. He did many good things. He did do many good things. But he also caused a chaos that we haven't seen before. There's a two-edged sword there. Remember, he's not a Christian. He's an unsaved man. Therefore, he is not for us, and he is not for Christ. Now, this is me calling out a very specific one. I might have just gotten myself in trouble. But this is an area where what I'm simply saying is discernment. We have to exercise discernment. You don't just immediately go, well, he's a Republican, Go Trump! That's all I need is he's a Republican. No. You have to stop. What is the spirit? What is he doing according to God's word? What is the fruit? And you have to stop and look at that. Now, to be even, I got to throw Biden in there. So I got to go that direction because, just in case. Nothing about him is scriptural. (laughs) I, I couldn't get anything. you got to stop, compare what he's doing to God's word, and then what is the fruit? And I really don't have anything. I don't. The next one. And I'm going to, I'm being very pointed, I know, and I'm not trying to give opinion. I'm trying to get you to understand this is a, I think it's a good way of thinking according to God's word, what's right, determining what's right. So the Asbury Revival. And yes, I'm going here too. The Asbury Revival is something that I know people here have seen, various people. Some may not know about it, but it's a revival going on at a Wesleyan Holiness uh, College. And it happened for 10 days, and now it's spreading to a bunch of other colleges. They stopped it there on the campus. And there is confusion. There is chaos over it in Christian circles, over whether this is right, whether it's wrong. And it's going both directions. I believe we have to stop and try the spirits according to God's word. We be skeptical of what's going on. In this, though, I would say, and many people on, you can watch YouTube videos, you can watch all these people assessing this. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. So don't immediately go, this is really wicked and bad. Stop for a second. Try the Spirit, see whether or not they're from God. Then, to the law and to the testimony. Go to God's Word. So it was 10 days of revival. The focus of it was really majorly on the Holy Spirit. There was some on Jesus, but it was mostly on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's here in this place, and we feel Him, and it's the experience. They'd sing songs 28 times in a row, basically chanting things. Is that contrary to the scripture? And I do think it is in one little area, just giving a scripture. John 16, verses 13 and 14 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't glorify himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Who is me? That's Jesus Christ. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So when we see a revival, 
what they're calling a revival, where the Holy Spirit is being lifted up over Jesus, you got to stop. That's not according to God's word. Something is off. It's just not quite right. They said it's a focus on sin and repentance. This is what they say, what they said. But we have the LGBT people supporting it. That doesn't really work, I think, because, and I know there's different groups, and you have people slipping in, and you can have that happening all over the place. And I'm not trying to give you my opinion on this. I'm just trying to point out things that just aren't right. They don't add up. How can LGBT be okay with it if it's against sin and preaching repentance? It sounds like confusion to me. According to God's word, sodomy is a sin. It's a hard statement, but that's the truth. The focus on feelings and experience. A lot of it was focused on feelings and experience, and still is. God's word focuses on faith and the gospel. Faith in God's word, faith in Jesus Christ, and the gospel. Spurgeon, and I'll bring this back to you, this statement I said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, it is knowing the difference between right and and almost right. And there's a fine line there. Then you got to look at the fruit. So, believe not every spirit, go to God's word, to the law, and to the testimony, and then look at the fruit. And this one, I'm not sure on, and this is where I'm just stopping, is I'm waiting to see what happens through this whole thing. I don't know. I don't know. There's things still going on, and I've actually seen some good things come out of it. I've seen bad things come out of it. So I think God can use this and has used it, yet I see certain bad things coming out of it too. There's an interest in the spiritual, but I'm not sure it's the right spiritual. So this is one of those where you sit back, you stop, and rather than me coming out and just condemning this thing and going, this is wicked and wrong, I personally can't do that. Yet. I think we should not quench the Holy Spirit. How far that means. But we should watch it. We shouldn't be going, yeah, go, we support this thing. We're all in with it. Because there's things that are wrong. Contrary to scripture. There are certain things that are right. So we're in a time of confusion. And by me, I I wanted to provide that one. Because I know there's discussion. And there's been people that have supported it. And there's people that are against it. And there's a confusion in it. We got to compare it to God's word. We got to test the spirits. And we got to look at the fruit. That's all I'm trying to say. Think of it that way for yourselves as you're going through studying these things, watching these things happen in this world. And we got to be patient. So many times we're very harsh with things immediately attacking, immediately going negative. we got to be patient and go according to God's word. So, just at the end here, men go after novel and false doctrines because they do not really know the truth. Men follow false doctrines and fallacies because they don't know the truth. Those doctrines are trying to attack our church. Those fallacies... We have to discern. We have to know there's deception, and we have to discern according to God's word. So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, Lord, I I hope this helped tonight, Lord. Father, I hope it glorified you as well. I know this wasn't um, the normal type of sermon, but more of a Bible study on, on discernment. Lord, help us be wise. Help us have discernment. Lord, help us try the spirits. And Lord, help us um, be loving and show grace to people. Lord, I I know my parents were saved in a Nazarene church. Lord, Wesleyan, Arminian, they were saved in that church. And as they learned the truth, they, they started coming to a Baptist church. Father, there are saved people, I'm sure, in these situations Save people that don't know the truth yet or are learning the truth, learning doctrine, learning more truth. Father, help us be a church that preaches truth. Lord, that stands on your word. Lord, that, that understands there are people that are growing and learning and in all different places of the Christian life. 
Lord, help us help those people. Help us be faithful servants, faithful brothers and sisters, Lord, that love you and serve you. Father, help us discern. Help us understand. There's so much confusion. And Lord, I know I've looked at things and and just wondered about things. What's going on there? Is it right? Is it wrong? What does your word say about it? Lord, help each of us stand on your word. And that's really what we need, Lord. We need to stand on your word in faith. So increase our faith, Lord. Increase our knowledge of your word and help us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes.